Good evening. Excellent. Mr. and Mrs. McGeorge, teaching faculty, staff, residential staff members, members of the community of Mexico, and of course, our middle school and high school cadets. The academic division of the Missouri Military Academy is once again delighted to sponsor the Leach Foundation Speaker Series. This series is committed to offering thoughts on leadership studies through the arts, law, education, civics, and the military. It is also offered in order to give our cadets, all of you, the opportunity to learn beyond the classroom, listen to thoughtful ideas about leadership, and be able to distinguish opinion from knowledge. It seems only fitting that Dr. George B. Forsyth, the 20th president of Westminster College, articulates his thoughts and ideas on leadership this evening. I say this for two reasons. First, one can learn a great deal about leadership from what Dr. Forsyth has accomplished both in education and the military. And two, for years, Westminster College has supported Missouri Military Academy's annual Wallace Fry speech contest by sponsoring the coveted Winston Churchill Award given to a cadet who speaks most persuasive, persuasively on behalf of a just cause. Prior to his administrative responsibilities at Westminster College, Dr. Forsyth spent 35 years of commissioned service in the United States Army, obtaining the rank of Brigadier General. While serving in the U.S. Army, Dr. Forsyth had a distinguished career as an educator and administrator at the United States Military Academy. He was an instructor and assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. He became a professor of psychology and leadership at the Academy, and in 1991 founded the Center for Leadership and Organizations Research, serving as the director until 1996. He served on the dean's staff as associate dean for academic affairs and for nine years served as vice dean for the academy. Dr. Forsyth has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in research methods, human development, and leadership. Besides his highly impressive career in the military and in college administration, Dr. Forsyth has achieved a great deal in the world of scholarship. He has published over 40 publications and presentations on leadership, student development, and post-secondary education. He has consulted with colleges and universities on curriculum, advised the Los Angeles Police Department on leadership training, and led a team to develop the National Military Academy of Afghanistan. Dr. Forsyth is a graduate of the United States Military Academy. He holds an MACT degree in social psychology and a PhD in education from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. MMA is pleased and proud to have him here tonight. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Wow. Friday night with a group of uh, teenage young men in uniform at a lecture on leadership. It didn't get any better than that. Kudos to the faculty and staff. Well, I want to say a special thank you to uh, President and Mrs. McGeorge, to your great dean, and to the faculty and staff for your kind hospitality and for inviting me here tonight uh, to share a few thoughts with you about a subject that is near and dear to our hearts, and that's leadership. We have a lot in common, you and I. I was a graduate from high school from an institution similar to yours. I graduated from Georgia Military Academy in the last millennium. And uh, so I, I know what it's like to live in a junior ROTC military high school environment, to live in a barracks, uh, and to have the com camaraderie of being uh, with uh, young men uh, as we grow up and as we prepare for lives of success, significance, and service. We also have a lot in common because as I drive uh, up uh, Highway 54, just came up uh, yesterday, I was coming up from Jefferson City back to Fulton, 
I noticed a sign from Missouri Military Academy. That sign said, learn to lead. I was also reading the Washington Post online uh, a couple of days ago, and what should pop up but a Missouri Military Academy advertisement said 360 degree education. Your school is founded on the notion that one can learn to be a leader. And that learning to be a leader involves the whole person. 360 degrees of education. I share those beliefs. I've spent my life, my career, learning to lead myself and helping others learn to lead. And I believe it best takes place in an atmosphere that nurtures the whole person 360 degrees with a broad-based education and fine skill development that prepares you to make a difference wherever you find yourself. So we have a lot in common. I want to get, begin uh, by telling you that I'm going to spare you the results of four decades of leadership research. As much as I'd like to tell you about some of the studies that I have conducted with colleagues over the years, I'm not going to do that. What I'd like to do is boil down what I've learned over the course of the last 45 or 50 years to what I think are a few simple principles that may resonate with you as you learn to lead in an educational environment that nurtures the whole person. So let's begin by thinking for a moment about what do we mean by leadership. Well, at its heart, leadership is about involving people to get things done. Leadership is fundamentally a social endeavor. It involves people. It's been studied by social psychologists and political scientists and sociologists for years. It's a, it, uh, leadership is fundamentally a social phenomenon. But it's also a phenomenon that has motion or movement, direction or purpose. Leadership is about involving people to get things done. And so fundamentally, I think leadership is ultimately about change. Leaders are change agents. So if leadership is about change, if leadership is about motion, moving, directing with a purpose towards a goal, then what's a leader? What do we mean when we say leader? Well, I recently read a book by an author, Kevin Hall, who, is, who explores in this book a wide range of words that have special meaning in our society today. And one of the words he looks at is the word leader. And Hall suggests that the word leader actually derives from two Indo-European words, li and der. Li means path, and der means finder. So leader, in its original meaning, is one who is a path finder. One who sees the signs along the path and shows the way. Direction, motion, involving others. So you might think of a leader as a pathfinder. We might also think about a leader in a slightly different way. And as I look out at this audience, wearing military uniforms, in a military organization, in a chain of command with a hierarchy. You might think of a leader as a position or a role. A position or a role that has authority. So you might look at your president, or your dean, or your commandant of cadets, or the commander of your unit, or your squad leader, or platoon leader, or company commander, and think of them as leaders because they occupy a role. But I think we would all agree that simply by occupying a role doesn't guarantee that one would lead. We all know folks who occupy those positions who, and roles who are not leading, who are not particularly effective leaders. 
And yet we expect that those in those positions of responsibility and authority will be leaders. I'm the president of a college. My, I occupy a role, I have authority, I have responsibility, and my college, my board of trustees, my students, my faculty, my staff, the alumni and, the parent, and parents expect me to play a variety of different roles. I manage the college, I represent the college, I tell the college's story, I raise resources so that the college can do its mission, I make sure that we in our college communities live by our values and our principles. But I am also, in all of those roles, expected to lead, and particularly to lead change. So what am I doing in that regard? Well, education today in America is in great transition, particularly higher education. It is a very rapidly changing environment with new groups of students, with new technology for learning, with new platforms for learning that it, in places make the residential traditional campus seem like an anachronism. Students are learning all over the globe from their, uh, their bedrooms or their living rooms. Uh, they're going to school, they're earning degrees, they're getting jobs. And so higher education in particular is in a great deal of change. And the type of institution that I have the privilege to lead, private, residential, liberal arts colleges, are learning how to adapt to a new environment. We intend and we will always stay true to our core mission of liberal arts education, leader development in a residential setting, but we're trying to figure out how to adapt and change to a new environment with new groups of learners who have new needs and, and, and new interests as well. And so my job in leading Westminster College involves helping to think through how Westminster adapts and changes to a new and different environment while maintaining the heritage and tradition that's ours. And that involves a lot of squishy stuff because nobody likes change. Change is difficult, change is frightening, change is, is hard. And so one of my jobs as a leader is to harness the energies of our community in my formal role to help facilitate the change process. But I want to challenge you to think about another way in which you could envision a leader. And that is not so much as a role, but as an identity. Being a leader is a way of being in the world, regardless of whether you have a position in the chain of command, a formal authority in your organization, that being a leader is really a way of being in the world. It's a way of seeing and reacting to the needs of a group of people and making a difference with that group of people. Kenna Cornel Cornelson was a student at Westminster College. She was a basketball player. She was a biology major. She's in graduate school right now. But in her junior year at Westminster, Kenna walked into my office one day and said, I want to I lead the effort on a service project. I have a passion for people who are less fortunate than we are here in America and here in central Missouri. I've gotten to know some of our international students, and as a bi biology major, I've come to the conclusion that clean drinking water in a community is critical to the life, the health, the education um, of the members of that community. And I want to raise money from Westminster College and the Fulton community to build clean drinking wells, uh, wells for clean drinking water in Africa. Now, she didn't have a formal position. This wasn't a student government organization project. She had a passion for doing something to better her world. And she walked into my office and said, I want to do this. And I said, well, Kenna, sit down. Let's have a conversation about that. I think this is a very noble cause. Uh, we're already into the fall semester. This is your junior year. And the campus community 
picks a service project every year that we focus all our time and energy on. And we've already picked that project for this year. So my suggestion to you is that you wait until next year and do this project because it's a noble project. We'll harness the energies of the campus community the following year when you're a senior and we'll get this done. And Kenneth said, thank you very much, Mr. President, but the people in a village in Africa can't wait another year for clean drinking water. And I said, well, Ken, I, I, I really think it's important that we not, uh, we not jeopardize your efforts, but we also not jeopardize the efforts of the community that are harnessed towards this particular other service project that we've done. And she said, I promise you, we won't. So Kenna went out. She drew a group of students together on her own who had a passion for this particular cause. She got organized. She studied what it would take to build wells for clean drinking water in small villages in Africa. She figured out how much money she would have to raise per well. And she set as a goal, we're going to raise $2,000 and we're going to build two wells in Africa for the people of a particular community. And I promise you, Mr. President, that we won't do it in a way that jeopardizes everything else. And sure enough, she pulled it off. She organized ourselves, she organized the community, she organized the schools in Fulton, and she raised enough money to make that happen. She didn't have a formal position. She didn't have a role. She saw herself as a person who could make a difference, and she stepped up and did. So I want to challenge you to think not only about the important responsibilities that you have if you are fortunate enough to be given a role that requires you to lead, but I want to challenge you to go beyond that. If you're a cadet private, you can make a difference in your community if you take on yourself the identity of a leader. You can make a difference. It may be in a club. It may be in an organization. It may be helping and empowering your squad leader, your platoon leader, your company commander to have a more effective unit. And in so doing, you lead. So. A leader is both can be thought of as a position, but more importantly, it can be thought about as an identity. And so regardless of what position you hold, you're the kind of person who wants to make a difference for the betterment of others. You can be a leader that makes change possible. So let's examine for a few minutes the characteristics that go into effective leadership. And you're going to get lists. And you probably memorized lists already of what makes for effective leadership. And I've spent a lot of time studying this and thinking about it, and I want to simplify it. I want to get down to a, a number that you can remember, focus on, and apply. If you look at Kenna's story, or you look at uh, the story of the challenges that I face trying to position a liberal arts college for success in the future, the first thing you have to have is a compelling vision. If you're going to be a pathfinder, if you're going to see the signs and help people find the way, you got to have a vision of where you're going, where you want to get to. And this is often the hardest. Kenna had a vision. It was a very broad vision. It was a vision that impacted the lives of people she didn't even know. But it was a vision to make a difference in small villages and communities in Africa by providing wells for clean drinking water. She felt deeply about that. And so she rallied folks around her, shared that vision, and it was a compelling vision for our community. And people pitched in and did work and raised money in order to make that happen. So having a compelling vision is critical. That helps you to know the direction in the end state that you seek to attain. The, the second thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to use another C word. I'm actually going to use four C words, the first being compelling vision. The second one is what I'm going to call competence. Now, this is a big, big old hairy word. It has a lot of stuff packed into it. But it's essentially knowing about what you're doing. It involves knowing the nature of the work that you have to do, 
Kenna had to go study about how you get wells with clean drinking water. She had to study how much it costs, how they build them, where they're needed, where they're located. She had to know about what she was doing. And I think that's an important part of what you're doing as you come to a leadership institution that educates you broadly. It expands your world. It opens up your opportunities to see things, to notice the signs that you wouldn't notice if you were less well educated. Kingman Brewster, who was the president of Yale University many years ago, said that the value of a liberal education, a broad education, is it helps you to see things and to recognize things that the less educated wouldn't see and recognize. But competence is really more than that, or at least as I see it. It's more than a broad education. It's also acquiring the skills to motivate, to inspire, to communicate. Uh, it's acquiring those leadership skills that you acquire every day here on campus to be able to initiate and affect the change. But it doesn't necessarily require, competence doesn't necessarily require that you be the smartest dude in the room. You don't have to know it all. You have to know enough to know what needs to be done. You have to know enough to know what you need to learn if you don't know enough. And you have to know enough to surround yourself with really good people that can help you get it done. Because leadership is not about doing it all yourself. It's about bringing people together to accomplish a compelling vision or purpose. So I think competence is a very broad set of characteristics that are really important. I don't know everything there is to know about running Westminster College. When I went to Afghanistan uh, and worked with a team of uh, Afghan officers, American officers, and Turkish officers to design and, and ultimately establish a new military academy for a new country, I didn't know everything there was to know. I knew an awful lot about officer education. I knew an awful lot about, um, about education in general. I knew a very little bit about Afghanistan. I had done my homework before I, I went. Um, but I had to learn while I was going. Some of my best teachers were the young men uh, from Afghanistan who were my translators, who helped me understand what the culture was like and what the challenges were and all those kinds of things. And then I surrounded myself with a team that knew a lot more than I did, and together we pooled our collective wisdom, and we were able to get it done. And I'm proud to say that is a vibrant and healthy uh, education of uh, institutional education today. So competence, you gotta know something. Nobody wants to be led by a stupid leader. Nobody. And I can guarantee you that no soldier wants to be led by a stupid leader. So your preparation here makes a difference and your ongoing preparation in life is gonna make a difference as you take on the identity of a leader and occupy those roles where you will have to lead. Compelling vision competence broadly defined. And the third piece is character. People aren't going to follow you down the path. They're not going to follow you down the trail. They're not going to let you be their pathfinder if they don't trust you. Character is at the heart of leadership. Uh, my West Point class's motto is serve with integrity. My class motto is on my ring. I wear it every day. And I think about it always. Integrity is a critical part of leadership. Character matters. So as you nurture and develop your values and you live by those values every day, particularly when people are not looking, you're building your character which will make a difference in the tough times and will create the conditions that will allow people to trust you as you help them move along a path towards a compelling vision. Kenna was successful because people trusted her. They knew her. She was on the basketball team and her teammates knew that she was a teammate that could be counted on. She lived by the principles of sportsmanship. She was a member of her sorority and her sorority sisters knew that she was a person that could be counted on. She had character. What she said and what she did were congruent. 
she lived a life of integrity. And so she was able to marshal people together, to trust her, to know that she was competent enough, and that her vision was compelling enough to make a difference in the lives of those folks in a village that she didn't even know about. So character, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. And we've seen it all the time. We've, we see it, unfortunately, in the news every day of leaders who violate our trust whose character is called into question. It makes it very, very difficult. Very difficult. Compelling vision, competence, knowing what you're doing, character, being a person that others can trust so that they'll follow you down the path towards the goal. And the last one I want to talk about, and it was actually, it's the one virtue or attribute that Sir Winston Churchill thought was the preeminent of all virtues, and that's courage. Leaders have to have courage, particularly today. Change hurts. People don't like to change. As much as we say, oh, we'd like to be different in some way, um, change is really difficult, particularly in complex organizations. And so leaders have to do the hard work. They have to take risks. Leadership is, change is ultimately about risks. And they have to have the perseverance, the determination. In fact, the word that we're using today in American society is the grit. They have to have the grit to see it through to completion. That's the hard work of leadership because that path is rocky. It's got lots of obstacles on it. You may have critters that come out and bite you all the time. We made a bold move at Westminster College a few years ago. Uh, we opened up a branch campus in Mesa, Arizona, because we thought it'd be a good idea, and we knew we wanted to extend our education and our brand to a group of people that uh, didn't have private liberal arts. They had big, large public universities, but nothing like we had to offer. So we went out to Mesa, Arizona, and we opened up a campus, and we ran it for a year, and we discovered that it didn't work. Is it? May have been a good decision, but it didn't work for us. That was a really risky decision. It was a scary decision to make the decision to go, and it was an even scarier decision to make the decision to come home. But we persevered. We learned a heck of a lot from that failure. We're a better school because of it. We're new and new and creative things that we've learned by taking a step, trying some change, recognizing it didn't work, picking ourselves up and getting back. Winston Churchill was a great leader during the Second World War for his country and I would say for the free world. And yet he failed as many, many times as he succeeded. And he is, he's the last lion, if you will, because he picked himself up every time, shook himself off and got on with the business at hand. I can't emphasize this enough. Courage, grit, determination matter. And I'm going to challenge you, young men, tonight. I'm going to challenge you because I've been working with young people for 45 years now. And I want, I want, to, I want to challenge you to take the tough steps, to try hard stuff, to try stuff that makes your head hurt, makes your body hurt, makes you uncomfortable, because that's the way you're going to build the courage and the grit that's going to really allow you to succeed in life, both individually and to succeed in life as a leader. I have to tell you, I'm disappointed when students on my college campus quit too soon. They got a tough course. They got a course from Dr. John Langton, who'll make your head hurt before you walk into classroom. And they're worried about a B, and so they quit. You're going to quit later in life when you're having trouble with, in your organization or with, with your family. I worry about athletes who quit too early. Don't do the extra lap. Don't do the extra lift because it's hard. I was talking to a group of young people last night. Um, and I was describing to them the experience I had when I went away to college. Let me tell you what it's like. And this probably won't be too frightening to you all because some of you have come from many miles away to come to this school. But when I was 17 years old, my parents put me on an airplane in Honolulu, Hawaii with a suitcase, 
and sent me to the United States Military Academy at West Point in New York. I had one legal page full of instructions for how to change planes in San Francisco, get from John F. Kennedy Airport to the Port Authority bus terminal, find the right bus, get on the bus, get to West Point, and report into school. That was my freshman move-in. 17 years old, my parents put me on a bus or on an airplane and said, hope you can find your way home for Christmas. I didn't think anything of it. I thought that's the way you're supposed to go to college. Parents put you on the plane and send you to college. Well, I was describing this to these two young people who happen to live in Jefferson City and are making the trip all the way to Fulton, Missouri for college. Boy, their eyes rolled in the back of their head. They couldn't imagine that. What about the widescreen TV? How about dad setting up my bunk bed? What about mom making sure my bed's made? No. You go to college. So I'm challenging you. Take the tough, take the tough road. Develop that grit, because that courage is going to make a difference in your lives. You've got to have a compelling vision. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to be confident in the business that you have at hand. Character matters, because people must trust you if they're going to follow you as a pathfinder down that path. And finally, it's tough going. Leadership's hard. It hurts. It's also the most satisfying thing you'll ever do. When you make a difference in the lives of other people, whether it's people in a vision in a, in a village in Africa, whether it's a community of, uh, of educators and students at Westminster College, whether it's designing a school in Afghanistan, whether it's leading your military unit to success on the battlefield, there's nothing more satisfied, satisfying than leading and making a difference in people's lives, whether you're in a role or whether you're not. But there's a challenge for you, and let me, let me uh, uh, leadership today is probably more difficult than it's ever been at any time, and this is one of the reasons why. We live in an interconnected world. Nothing goes unnoticed. I'm fond of saying everything I do in Fulton, Missouri, or everywhere, to include tonight, reflects on Westminster College. If I bump into somebody at Walmart, Westminster College has just bumped into somebody in Walmart, and somebody could Take a picture, send a message, and Westminster is the less for it. Social media is making a huge difference in the lives of leaders as we try to make a difference in the world. It can be a positive force if you use it as a positive force, but can, it can be a real challenge. There's, a, there's an irony in our, our society today as we look for um, opportunities to lead. And that is, I would argue that life is becoming increasingly more complex and yet people are increasingly looking for simple solutions and quick fixes. You just have to watch the news at night to look at the complexity of the world around us that our leaders are dealing with and to look for, look at others who want quick fixes and simple solutions to see the world in black white terms. That's not the way it is. So the challenge of leadership today is to figure out how to manage the complexity in ways that are compelling, that make a difference in the lives of others. I salute you. I salute you for what you are doing every day to prepare yourselves, even at this formative stage in your life. In this early stage in your life, you've chosen to live in a community and an environment that focuses on helping you learn to lead and to become a whole person. A person ready to assume the responsibilities and to take on and own those responsibilities that are the identity of a leader. To make a difference in your world wherever you find yourself and regardless of what position, role, or authority you have. I challenge you to go out and be the change and have the courage and the character to do that. It's been a blessing to be with you. I'm enormously encouraged by you all. I think the future of our world, of our country, and all the countries represented here tonight is bright because it's in your hands. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.
Let's thank Dr. Forsyth again for his wonderful words, please. We will now entertain some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Major Baker will be walking around with the uh, roaming mic. Now remember, I'm a professor, so I got a long wait time. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. My name is Cadet Maxwell Broughton. I was Hello, Maxwell. How are you, sir? Good, sir. How are you? Did I answer your question from earlier tonight? Yes, sir, you did. Good. Thanks. Um, during your military career, has there ever been a moment in which somebody close to you, like a really good friend, committed a dishonorable act, and you had to confront them or respond to that? And if so, how? Um, uh, yes, uh, several times. Um, I'll share with you one, uh, one occasion, um, and th th um, they were in the process of, uh, of committing a dishonorable act, let me say that. I was a battalion executive officer in the 1st Battalion, 23rd Infantry in Korea. It was um, the winter of uh, uh, 1981. Uh, it was, uh, we were preparing for our annual general inspection. Uh, which was uh, essentially the battalion, one of the battalion commander's critical report cards. And we had to, um, you know, so we were getting inspected in everything in the division or uh, in the battalion, policies, procedures, security, everything. And we had had a number of challenges uh, in our battalion uh, in Korea in 1981. Uh, we had a terrible repair parts uh, supply issue. Uh, you know, our vehicles had challenges. Uh, you may remember that there was a point in time in the late set. You wouldn't remember this. What am I talking about? You all may remember this. In the late 70s, we were going to come out of Korea. So we sort of turned off the water spigot of funds. So we had challenges with repair parts. We had challenges with maintenance. Uh, we had a lot of turnover and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and uh, the inspection was such that uh, one, one company was inspected each day for five days. And uh, I think in every category, three of the five companies had to pass in order for the battalion to be rated as pass. There were a couple of companies in a category that could not do well. And our headquarters company was, quite frankly, a mess in a variety of different ways. Um, and so the night before the headquarters company inspection, I walked into the arms room, and um, they were there was a tiger team of lieutenants. They were all a company executive officers who were going through the headquarters company arms room to make sure that all of the inspections had been done and, and, and it was good to go. And um, I noticed that there was one lieutenant, I had actually, uh, who was poised over the typewriter, uh, preparing an inspection sheet for several months previous to that. In other words, he was prepared to forge an inspection sheet for an inspection that didn't occur so that they wouldn't get caught and everything would be good. And so he looked up at me and he said, uh, uh, I said, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, we're checking out and what have you found? Well, they, they, they didn't do an inspection a couple of, couple of months ago and uh, you know, they're gonna get busted for this. And I said, well, if they didn't do the inspection, they didn't do the inspection. So look, look me dead in the eyeballs, do not fudge the report. And uh, this is an important lesson for you lieutenants. We're going to do the right thing because character matters. And if we busted the inspection, we bust the inspection. So be it. We'll be a better unit from learning from our mistakes. Um, so that was a challenge for me. I was a leader. I had to confront a person who hadn't quite committed the crime yet, but was in the process of doing it. Uh, and I spent some time with all those folks doing a little lesson on, on what character and what integrity and what's really important in life means. So they didn't, and we went on and had the inspection. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good question. There, there are a couple other stories I have, but I've read, I'm not going to tell them tonight. So, thanks. Good question.
Dr. Forsyth, yes, sir. could you um, tell the boys, tell the cadets, probably in today, in the 21st century, uh, if they're looking to be leaders, whether it's in business or education or the military, um, what, how important is empathy in working with your people and in leading? Yeah, uh, great point. Uh, I gave you four big categories of thing. I think empathy probably, um, I, I would lump that into the character piece. Um, I, I think an important part of character um, uh, is uh, the ability to empathize with others, um, the ability to, un to put yourself in someone else's boots and, and understand what they're going through. There are a whole list of other things that I could have talked about in uh, under each one of those categories, but empathy is is certainly an important part of it. Um, I, th I think you have to be able to empathize, and, and one of the things that you're going to have to do as you lead change, as you understand uh, people's concern, is to uh, uh, understand, particularly in the change process, that people will could be frightened or scared. Um, I've, I've led many uh, uh, change efforts in which uh, people were scared, and empathy allows you to put yourself in their shoes and understand what they're feeling and understanding that that feeling's natural. And then figuring out how to work together to overcome those fears to get the job done and to make a difference. So, good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm um, Garcia JR from Texas. What would be the best piece of advice you can give us for dealing with difficult people in the workplace? Oh, man, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good question, how to deal with difficult people. Do you have difficult people in your workplace? Um, uh, first, first of all, I, I think it's important that, um, that upfront expectations be clear. Uh, and, and people understand what, uh, particularly in complex organizations, uh, what, their, what the expectations of performance are for their particular role uh, in the organization. So that, I think that's really important. I, I think the second thing that's important is good, honest feedback. Um, uh, th th there's no substitute for uh, confronting uh, people who are difficult or getting in the way of, of the work and the job, uh, giving them honest feedback, and... Um, uh, laying out change plans. And I, I've had to do that throughout my career. Um, for the most part, I've been blessed with uh, colleagues who, um, who resp have responded generally uh, well to that feedback and have changed their behavior. Um, obviously, complex organizations, uh, organizations of any type, also have formal disciplinary processes. And it, it may come to the point where, uh, where discipline is necessary. Um, if, uh, if people's behavior doesn't change. Um, because at the end of the day, you have to look out for the welfare of the organization, of, of the collective, as you're moving forward. And, uh, you know, disagreeable people, people who are working against you, people who are self-centered and self-focused, um, uh, work against getting down the path to the goal. Um, and then finally, if, if there's an opportunity, uh, or if you have the discretion or the authority, um, and in, in my case, I do, um, if all of those things fail, then uh, sometimes you have to say, uh, this isn't the right team for you to be on, and you move them on. Um, but I think those, uh, those other steps are, are critical in that process. I, w I would also say that it's important, this may get back to the empathy question, to understand what the source of the disagreeableness is. Uh, some of it may be legitimate. I, I've got some wonderful uh, colleagues that I work with that are sort of ordinary all the time, uh, but they protect me from my blind spots. They help me think about, they help, help us think about things in, much more broadly. Um, we trust them because we know they're committed to the mission. They're not just doing it to, uh, to be ornery. Uh, so I think, you, I, I think factoring uh, that is, an, is important. Uh, one of the lessons I've learned in life is to the extent that you have the discretion, surround yourself with really good people to start with. Um, when you're building a team, Kenneth was building a team, 
uh, to get this done and attracting people. She surrounded herself with really good people that could get it done. It's not often the case in complex organizations, in large bureaucracies. Um, you know, people are there for a variety of different motivations, and you have to sort of work those processes. But um, one of the real key lessons I've learned over the years, particularly at more senior levels where I have the discretion to bring people onto the team is surround yourself with good folks. Great question. Thank you. Uh, as a uh, North Carolinian, I thought maybe you could uh, expand on this a little bit in the light of Michael Jordan. Often it's said that the smartest people in the room is the room. And yeah. Jordan, during his playing career, always wanted to surround himself right. with uh, bright people yep. and, and, and good players. Uh, but at the end of the game, he wanted the shot. Yep. So could you speak a little bit to the balance between seeking good feedback and then at the end of the day still having the courage to move forward on that critical vision that you have? Um. I, I wasn't sure that the question, I, I had trouble connecting those two parts. Try me again. Well, in working with a group of, of smart individuals yep. and trying to surround yourself mm -hmm. and, and truly desiring that feedback, yeah. but at the end of the day, you're the, yep. the change agent. Can right. you speak to the balance yep. between yep. those two entities? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, in my role today in particular, um, you know, I'm, I, I am often the guy with the ball to make the last shot. I ultimately have to make the call. You're right. And, and I think that's why that goes back to, I mean, competence does matter. Um, because at the end of the day, you surround yourself with good people. They give you lots of input and feedback. You s wrestle it out. But at the end of the day, I have to make the decision. And I'm responsible for that decision. So you're absolutely right. And so I've got to know enough to be able to exercise judgment when all the other smart people are, are in the room to sort that kind of stuff out. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have to be the smartest person in the room, but I got to be smart enough to be smart when it counts. So that, I think that's a very, very good comment. There's actually, a, have you read the book, um, uh, Certain Trumpets? It's actually a good book about leadership that looks, a, looks at leadership in a variety of different areas of life. And the conclusion, uh, it's written by Gary Wills, a political scientist, and the conclusion he comes to is that um, the, the leaders that have made a difference in a variety of different fields of life haven't been the most talented performer, the smartest person in the room, but they've been really smart and really talented so that they know enough to make a difference. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the, sort of the theme that I was trying to pick up on there. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks. I was going to start Isaiah Atkins here. Um, as me being an athlete uh, on the team, uh, like he was kind of saying, uh, how do you, how would you uh, motivate your teammates to um, recognize the leaders and uh, pursue them to uh, find the same goals that you would have, um, to, you know, on, during a season or so? Right. Because um, our team, we can't seem to find the motivation or uh, the, the right leaders on our team to bring us to come together as a team. Uh can you say a little bit more about that? What what kind of challenges are you facing? Um, just just really just finding the motivation and you know coming together and seeing the goal as one mm -hmm. you know, and seeing the bigger picture, um, and you know just getting together and being an actual team. Sure. I know we we come from all over the world mm -hmm. and we don't see the the same aspects, and so it's uh, kind of hard to bring us all together because uh, we do have that diversity. Yeah. What kind of team? Basketball. Basketball. Okay. Yes, sir. I got the coach right here, right? <laughs> um, um, that's a great question. Uh, I, 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 was a, uh, I was a student athlete when I was in high school and college. Um, I ran uh, track at Army. Um, and I, I think athletic teams are some of the best classrooms for leader development there are. Um, because uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's real stuff. Uh, there's win-lose. 
Um, there's coming together. There, there are people who bring different skills and talents together um, to, uh, to accomplish a real goal that matters. Uh, so I think uh, athletics are, are, are great ground. I actually would say, I, I, I put a different twist on this and say that the challenges that your team is facing right now uh, people from all over the world with sort of different perspectives on on the sport itself and what they bring, and uh, uh, it, it may be the best um, classroom you'll ever be in. Um, because trying to figure out how to bring those folks together is the leadership lesson that you're going to learn, you and your teammates are going to learn. Uh, obviously, uh, thinking about uh, what the goals of the team are, uh, thinking about individual roles and responsibilities, um, encouraging one another to, um, uh, to train together, to work together. If you can find uh, ways off the court to be together, uh, to build a, a team and the like, um, it may work, it may not work. But if it doesn't work, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, great, because you've learned how to bring a very uh, disparate and talented group together and you've uh, seen and figured the struggles. Um, our men's basketball team is in, in, the, in the tank right now at West Missouri. They are really struggling. Uh, but I argue that they're probably learning more, uh, more life lessons that will carry them through because uh, they've got to have grit to go out there on the court every day. They're hustling every day. You know, they're getting beat by three points at five points at the end of the game. They're, they're learning a lot of really good lessons that will stand the test of time. Uh, and they're having to sort it out for themselves. Our women, on the other hand, are on a high. And, uh, they're doing great things. So that's probably a roundabout way. I don't know enough of the details of that, but what I would encourage you is don't get discouraged about the leadership opportunities you're having. You may be having, uh, uh, in many ways, a more significant leadership experience because you're going to have to gut your way through this than a team that's in the flow right now. So thanks. Good question. Do I have time for one more story? Yeah, the basketball story. Our women's basketball team um, last year um, decided that uh, in addition to uh, defending their conference championship, uh, they wanted to finish number one in the nation in grade point average. Now that took everybody working to do that. Uh, and the team captain got everybody together. They sort of got themselves together and said, let's see if we can do this. You know, we've been in the top 25. Let's see if we can, we can make it number one. So they... They, they actually worked their way through that, organized their course, uh, their uh, reporting out on their courses, and they're not taking uh, basket weaving for athletes. They're, they're either bio majors or business majors, so they're, they're doing tough stuff. And um, sure enough, they organized it, and it, it had an interesting impact on their performance on the court as well uh, because they were coming together uh, in study hall. They were coming together... Uh, encouraging each other when they were studying together in the same major and they were coming together on the basketball court and they finished number one in the nation. Pretty cool. So, there are lots of successes you can have in that athletic realm. Hi. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Hi. Kedit Bavak. My question is, what was your point of view about Afghanistan before you went and did it change when you came back? Yes. That's a great question. Um, I went to Afghanistan in the fall of 2003. Uh, and I went, um, I went because I was reading email on a Saturday morning um, in September before an Army football game, and uh, the message was from the dean that said, let's talk Monday morning, and I read down, and the commander in Afghanistan had sent a message to the superintendent uh, saying, I, I need to build an, ar an officer corps for an army that we're building in Afghanistan, and I need some help from West Point. And, I actually knew a little bit about that. I had some confidence in that area, so I wrote back and said, send me, turn, turn to my wife as we were going up to the football game and said, I'm going to combat. I'm going to build a school. Uh, so I, I read and studied very hard uh, as much as I could about Afghanistan in the time before I deployed. Um, I was there, um, uh, uh, actually I was there right uh, shortly after the invasion of Iraq. Um, and so uh, I, was, uh, I was amazed at um, the lack of institutions and infrastructure in Afghanistan. Um, it, was a, it was a pretty devastated place as a consequence of the Soviet occupation, 
the um, civil war and then the reign of the Taliban. Uh, they were broken people with broken institutions, and yet I fell in love with them. Um, I really admired and respected them. You talk about grit. You talk about courage. Um, you know, the Afghans have been around for a long time and, uh, and, uh, and, and will continue to do so. So I actually fell in love with them and enjoyed them. When I left Afghanistan, um, uh, my Afghan colleagues uh, told me two things. The first thing they told me is the highest compliment I've ever gotten in my professional life. I'll never forget it. They looked me in the eyes and they said, you're the first Westerner that we've dealt with who ever listened to us. The second thing they said is, are you here for the long haul? Because we know that your military is, uh, is now focused in uh, Iraq. Um, I left with some high hopes, but very concerned that America's energy uh, and resources were going to go into Iraq. I actually got on an airplane at Bagram Air Base and landed in Baghdad to do a similar mission in Iraq and uh, came to the conclusion that um, uh, it was going to be a tough go for the Afghans. Uh, and in my judgment, and I, I don't think I'm alone in this, if we had a shot, and that's a very complex and very difficult situation, um, and, a, and a society uh, that has been dealing with these challenges for centuries, millennia maybe, um, if we ever had a shot, we had it back then. Um, but when we sent all our resources to Iraq for, uh, for reasons that we all know about, we probably lost the opportunity. Um, yeah. I brought my, uh, I, I helped sponsor my, the young man who was my translator um, to immigrate to the States with his family. And he's now an American citizen and lives in Fulton with his wife and five children. Great guy. And he, he came to America. Yes. Uh, sir, my mm -hmm. name is Nehemiah Simmons, and my question for you is, it seems that there is somebody that you are following to become the leader that you are to this day. And if there was, why? Um, I, I missed the first part of the question. It seems that there is somebody in your life that you are following. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. I've had a lot of um, uh, mentors and role models throughout my life. Um, I, I would say, um, uh, you know, I, it, this is, this, most of us will, would probably say this. My parents had a big effect on my life. I was an only child. Uh, my father was a very successful career Army officer, retired as a three-star general, um, and uh, really inspired me uh, and sort of coached me about what it meant to be a leader. I'll, I, 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 my earliest memory of my father, I was probably younger than you are, um, when I asked him, what does it take to be a leader? He said, know your job, set the example, and take care of others. Um, and I've never forgotten that today. And if you look at the characteristics I talk about, they're all embedded in it. He made a big difference. But my dad was deployed a lot. Um, he had uh, three tours in Vietnam uh, and um, was gone a lot. Um, and my mother had a pretty profound in, impact on me. She was, the, she was the one who threw the baseball with me and the football and went to all my track meets and um, uh, made sure my shoes were shined and my bed was made and all those kinds of things to build some self-discipline in me. So my parents were very significant in my life. I had a very uh, significant first sergeant when I was a young officer um, who um, I got a company command at a very young age when I was a lieutenant and he was my first sergeant. And he took me under my under his wing. Uh, the day I took command of the company, I was probably 23 years old. He walked in and he sat down and he said, uh, Lieutenant Forsythe, you and I are going to get one th thing straight. You're going to command this company and I'm going to help you run it. And he mentored me uh, through that process and uh, uh, Command Sergeant Major Joe Cross, great guy. And then I had a, real, a couple of really good mentors early on in my academic career as well. So it makes a difference. I just had a uh, a young uh, member of our, this, this is amazing, uh, a young member of our staff who's a Westminster College graduate. Um, we were doing some business. At the end of that, she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm 28 years old. Um, I need a mentor. When you uh, retire as the president, would you be my mentor so I can check in with you and 
continue to grow and develop as a leader. I'm, there's no higher compliment than somebody saying, will you help me grow up? It's a real blessing. So, One of the things that good leaders do is grow leaders. So I was fortunate to have that. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Hello, sir. Hi. My name is uh, Cadet Johnston. Hi. And I have a question to your earlier remark about how technology has changed our society. Sure. Yeah. And I've read an article online earlier today that said that my generation after this is going to have less relationships with women and focus on issues that involve sexism. And I would like to ask if this is going to influence leadership with groups that have multiple sexes along with yeah. how this is going to affect relationships in the long, long run of marriage. Oh. That, that, one of the other things you have to know about competence is when you're out of your, when you're out of your skill set. But let, let me try that. Um, I, I don't know that I can comment directly about that article. I haven't read it. But uh, let, let me take a step back from that and ask, uh, and let's think together about what the implications of technology are for relationships in general. Uh, uh, that may be uh, sort of what under, underlies that. And, and um, I, I think that's, a, you know, as an older person, I, I look at the, the way in which um, young people relate to each other via technology, whether it's uh, uh, Twitter or Instagram. I guess Facebook is passe at this point in time, but Facebook or whatever, and um, it, it appears to me that um, those relationships that are built in virtual space have a different feel to them, if you will, uh, for someone who's spent most of their time uh, not in virtual space uh, than those. And I, I think that's going to present a real set of um, interesting challenges that we're going to have to learn from your generation about. Uh, as you go forward and in terms of how you relate to one another uh, in physical space, how you communicate with one another. I think we communicate very differently uh, online and virtually than we do face to face. Uh, and so I think that's going to create a, a series of challenges and opportunities and particularly for leaders. And I would say the other uh, issue with technology that lots of people have written about is, um, is the sort of notion of the leader is at the top of the pyramid. Uh, technology and the relationships are, are, are much more lateral now, uh, and they're much more um, ubiquitous. And that's gonna, that's, that has already and will continue, I think, to create uh, challenges for leaders who are trying to bring people together and, 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 uh, and work together uh, on complex uh, problems. Uh, um, we, had a, we had an emergency exercise today, and we spent most of our time talking about what happens when people take to social media when you're in the middle of an emergency and what impact that'll have on you being able to get your work done. So I, I think that's a great question. I, I'm not sure I have any wisdom on that. Uh, uh, but good luck to you all in figuring that out. And, and I hope it doesn't have an impact on, your, on the relationship between the sexes. I hope, it, I hope there are, continue to be positive and healthy relationships between men and women in our society. That's key to the future. Have you noticed in the your schools as a principal that having these relationships go down in general have you have you noticed this trend in any of your students? Um, I, I, it's no surprise that there are cha challenges on relationships between men and women in society in general, and that that's manifest in uh, on campuses across the country. Uh, we're having a serious conversation about that on our campus about. Um, uh, in particular, with respect for women, and um, uh, and that 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 conversation is being led by men on our campus, and encouraged uh, by the women on our campus. So, and I think it's a good, healthy, positive sign. Do you think the emphasis on this subject is actually causing the divide? Um, no, I think it's something we need to pay attention to. And we need to work through this together. Yeah. Did I walk into something there? <laughs> Since you were in Afghanistan once, 
And the, uh, I wanted to ask, what's the key to change this country? Because in the past, Alexander tried to change this country. He failed. British tried to conquer this country. He failed. And the years later, Russians, they paid a huge price to dominate this country in order to achieve their global strategy. But that caused the collapse of the, um, this empire. What's the key to change, this change Afghanistan? Afghans. Sorry? Afghans. Um, I, I, this, is a, this is a very good example about the complexity of change. And at the end of the day, I think, um, uh, I, I would like to think that despite all the rhetoric we've heard, um, our intentions were good in terms of helping um, the Afghan people to create the kind of society in which they want to live. Um, but it, um, I think at the end of the day, Afghans are going to want to create, uh, are going to be the key to creating the society in, in which they want to live. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm way over time. You ask good questions. Thank you. Uh, let's thank Dr. Forsyth again uh, for his talk. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, they always appreciate it. They always appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank all uh, the teachers and staff members and the res fa residential faculty for attending and helping put on this thing, the director of maintenance, the IT department, just everyone who's been here and all those who've supported it. Thank the cadets for the great questions. Doing this on a Friday night, you guys are doing a good job. Keep up the good work and uh, have a good Friday evening, the rest of the Friday evening. All right, well, BC, come on up. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, they were good. They were good. That's yeah. really good. That was good. We'll see you.